a fellow in the British Academy, and she was also elected in the Ac American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I should also say that she met the uh, Swedish king twice, um, and she was a headliner in an event with Al Gore as opening act. So not many people can say that. And last but, only, last, last but not least, Harriet is also a very nice uh, and fun person to work with. So before we uh, go on with the summer of today, just a few practicalities. Um, Harriet will speak about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, we've got a total time of about 90 minutes. We'll see how we go. So there's enough plenty space for uh, Q&A afterwards. So please think of, of questions and comments while you're listening. Um, and I'll do my best to moderate the session um, at the end. Um, but for now, Harriet, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rob. Um... Sorry, online people. Oh, I was just talking about me. So it's been fine. It's been fine until now. Um, so yeah, so it's been really lovely to spend the last couple of days with colleagues here on the on the project and sharing the data and hearing about the PhD work that's going on. So thanks again for inviting me and hosting me here for these three days. Uh, so today I want to spend some time thinking about a paper that I have recently published. It's something that I've been thinking about for a few years. Um, I'm definitely not done with thinking about it. The paper is a kind of provisional intervention into that debate, and I hope it will be of some interest to you. Um, I guess it comes with a fair amount of nostalgia. Um, that may be, you know, what accompanies going through a pandemic. I think a lot of people in my generation are a bit nostalgic about things. Um, also, maybe a rather significant birthday, you know, one of those ones with a zero on the end. That's made me feel a bit nostalgic as well. Um, but what it's what I've been trying to kind of think about is if when I started my PhD work here in um, 1995 or 96, when I was based here at Macquarie, I was interested in kind of thinking about what did new global environmental challenges mean for how we understood what environmental politics was and how environmental politics was emerging. What I've been interested now to think about is, is environmental politics still really the same thing? And if it's changing, what does that mean for us? So there we go. That's what I'm interested in doing. Now, I think maybe because it's open on Zoom, I can't control it from here because this button isn't working. <laughs> so, I think it might be that it's on that computer only. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right, so there we go. It's fine. But I have to say that I I, um, I didn't think I was gonna be so nostalgic that I would actually even turn to Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> it's probably a little bit of a sign of the state of affairs in the UK, which we'll try not to dwell on too much. But I was, I have always actually been really interested in the speech that Margaret Thatcher gave to the United Nations in 1989, in November, 1989. And there's a whole kind of reason why there's a whole set of reasons why uh, Margaret Thatcher may have found herself on the world stage at the UN in New York, making the case for a, not one, but a series of global environmental agreements, um, which were then to become the United Nations Conventions on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Desertification three years later. But it's a, it's a really interesting speech for many different reasons, also because you know the relationship between conservative politics and the environment many different kinds of other things we could we could kind of draw out of that speech but here what I've been uh, most interested to think about is how it epitomizes the kind of modernization of environmental governance that took place at that time so the idea is that we should work through globally we need something that we're going to do together each country has to contribute the work ahead will be long and and exacting, but it should be, you know, something that we do hopeful of success and not fearful of failure. 
And what I think, you know, this speech and many other kind of discursive moves at the time, you know, and, and commentators, including Albert Will and Martin Heyer, working at, and, and Ulrich Beck and many others at the time, kind of coined this idea that we were looking at the emergence of this ecologically modern, modernist governance approach. And looking, you know, with, a, with the benefits of hindsight, I think we can see that there are kind of four key kind of dynamics there. Um, so the first, if you like, we can start with the idea that scientific evidence can determine the extent and nature of the problem and the best solutions that it has. So while we were moving from an idea of having to have evidence of pollution in order to act towards a more precautionary approach, it nonetheless cemented the idea that it was scientific evidence, scientific knowledge that would be the great determiner of action. The second and related issue then is that the climate problem was regarded as a singular issue of pollution of the global commons that needed to be addressed and the scientific evidence would tell us you know how much we needed to lower the temperature by and how much greenhouse gases you know emissions that would relate to as a singular issue it needed international action because of this you know the commons nature of the atmosphere that is an atmosphere that we all share none of us can act on it alone we're all tied into what the actions are that others do and of course solutions were primarily thought of as what would emerge from technological progress and the inter internalization of um, externality so climate problem regarded as a kind of externality that if we could get the price right and bring it into the economy then we could find economic solutions to it so these are kind of the you know mainstays of ecologically modernist climate governance and what i want to speak about um, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so is that i think these tenants are coming undone about in terms of what the nature of the climate problem is and therefore what its solutions are now Again, <laughs> it's been an interesting few years in the UK. Um, well, what I want to argue is then fundamentally that the problem of what climate change is has changed. Now, in doing that, you'd be glad to know that things are not so bad that I've become a climate skeptic. <laughs> and nor am I arguing that climate change is a, a wholly, um, you know, it's, it's not a, it's, I'm not saying climate change isn't real and neither am I saying it, that it is socially constructed. But I am saying that the way in which we problematize, define problems in relation to particular schemes of thought, diagnosis of deficiency and promises of improvement, as Tanya Murray Lee puts it, shapes what it is that is intelligible, what it is that the problem is that we need to act upon and what then it, how it can be comprehended and contained and the kinds of solutions that make sense. And you can contrast Boris Johnson's speech, also an orator of kind, um, at COP26, but it's not the end of climate change, it can and it must mark the beginning of the end. Right, Churchillian there, we have the ideas, we have the technology, we have the bankers, we have the corporations and the NGOs. But the key uh, phrase that was used over and over again by the UK government is that the climate problem is a problem of coals, cars, cattle and trees. So that when we start to think about what the climate problem is, it's not a problem of the global atmosphere anymore. It's a problem of coal, cars, cash, and trees. The problem is not singular, it's multiple. The problem is systemic, so it's about cash. It's kind of a system. Uh, cars, also a system, and infrastructure, as it happens. So we're not thinking anymore, and trees, you know, throwing a bit of nature for good measure, um, we're not any more thinking here of a global commons problem. We're thinking of multiple different kinds of problems that all need different and diverse kinds of solutions. And so we, you know, a nod to being in Melbourne. I'm very fond of your coffee. But we see all sorts of things now becoming related to the climate problem. So rather than it just being a matter of the emissions that are going into the atmosphere, the climate problem becomes something about, well, you know, those people who drink black coffee are like better people than the people who drink latte, which is unfortunate for me um, on account of the fact that I do like a flat white and a latte occasionally. Uh, but here we can see the kind of idea that the climate problem is being infused into and connected to a whole set of different sites and multiple things. And Frank Beerman and a colleague at Utrecht University as well, um, wrote an article in the 30th anniversary edition of the journal Environmental Politics, where he makes the argument that the environmental policy paradigm 
It's a traditionally widely shared belief that a definable environment exists outside the human sphere that needs to be protected and that, that should be done by environmental institutions is coming under strain under the conditions of the Anthropocene where these boundaries and distinctions between what is and isn't an environmental problem and what is and isn't human and nature are becoming more indistinct, where the root causes of environmental challenges lie beyond boundaries of environmental policy. And so he's, he argues in this paper that its techno managerialist approach is coming under pressure. Um, and I very much agree with Frank on this point, um, but I also want to kind of push the argument a little bit further. And to do so, I, you know, as Rob said earlier in the introduction, I'm known for the work that I do on urban climate governance, so it won't come as a surprise to you that, that I've been exploring this kind of debate within the urban uh, arena. So I, I want to make the argument that it's not only environmental policy that is becoming frayed, but actually the ecological modernism that underpins it. And while Frank makes the argument in the paper that this is theoretically what should be happening to the notion of environmental policy, he kind of stops short of saying that it's actually apparent in the world around us. But I actually want to argue that it's extremely apparent to me that, um, and I think probably to quite a lot of other people as well, I'm not wanting to claim a kind of crystal ball here, um, but, it, but that it's a question of, of relating the different things that we might see around us. So the urban is of course an arena where the climate problem has long since lost its moorings from being a singularity. Urban climate governance is a matter of roads, sewers, so light bulbs, roofs, parks, backyard chickens, smart meters, supermarket fridges, and you know the list kind of goes on. This is often seen as a bit of a problem in the environmental governance field, that if everything is about climate change, then where are its boundaries? But when we work in a kind of paradigm set up by Foucault and many other since, of how do we think about what constitutes successful governance? Foucault points out that as governance is only as successful as it is able to in, enroll and entrain a number of things to its cause. So the more, you know, that he, he argues the apparatus of government have a constant tendency to expand their centrifugal. So they incorporate more and more elements in order to govern the object that they're concerned with. So it involves organizing or anyway, allowing for the development of ever wider circuits. So this expansion of climate change into everything that one could think of in the urban arena is a sign of the success of governance rather than of its failure seen from this perspective and it tells us something about then where it is that the governing is taking place and I think it also starts to point to why it is that we have um, the fraying of the ecological modernist paradigm and the emergence of experimentation. So again here I've been um, you know Doing a bit of reading and writing as we talked about earlier <laughs> so, so connection between reading and writing here but um a lot of this is is you know uh, thought-based work drawing on a number of other um colleagues work at the moment and particularly also stephanie wakefield a geographer um, based in florida who's been working on the idea of the anthropocene city for the last four or five years or more um and it, her argument here is that and I think it's echoing um, some of the points that I've been making in the work on experimentation with Vanessa Castabrotto and others, that the Anthropocene city is demanding a new kind of normal where the kind of modernist environmental governance based on the separation of the human and nature and kind of ideas of control, planning, progress is coming under stress um, and new kinds of forms of governance are emerging she calls it here, diverse modular interlaced system-based designs working at multiple sites and scales to reconnect urban fragments. So she's looking at this kind of idea that it's kind of design-based thinking, multiple different kinds of interventions, trials, tests, demonstrations, that is now characterizing the governing of the Anthropocene city precisely because it is this kind of multiplicity and fragmented whole. You can't govern it as if it was a modernist singularity. You have to be governing it in all of its difference and that that's why we're seeing what we do. So experimentation then we can argue emerges in this search for an alternative means of governing in response to both the changing nature of the climate change, climate problem and this kind of anthropocene condition where you know which kind of push the limits of what can be ecological modern. So this, I think, helps us to understand why it is when it comes to the city that experimentation is no longer seen as singularities, but rather as an approach, as James Evans and colleagues have said, 
associated set of practices that characterizes contemporary urban innovation. And you know, papers from a diverse set of countries from Sweden, Chile, South Africa to China and many other places in between, including, of course, uh, Australia um, and much of Europe show this kind of significant kind of depth and breadth of experimentation happening in the city. And in recent work in China that Vanessa has been doing with a PhD student there, she's made this argument that the conventional model of the policy process, even in a context such as China, is becoming under pressure from this kind of idea of experimentation. Although they make the arg argument in that paper that experimentation takes a very particular form in relationship to the Chinese state. But I think it's really, it's a very interesting case to look at because it's one where, of course, you would think that planning would be very dominant um, because of the kind of whole history of centralized planning in the state, in the way that the state works. So we have found quite so much significant level of experimentation in the Chinese case, I think particularly makes um, and helps to make this argument. So I hope where we've got to so far is an argument that suggests that there is many, from many different angles, people writing from different kinds of disciplines, the idea of ecologically modernist governance is coming under question. Um, and yeah, as I said at the beginning, I'm certainly you know, not claiming any novelty in that, but it's rather about drawing these threads together to think about what does that mean in, in the urban context. And so then we see this kind of world of permanent experimentation or emerging. Now, of course, for some, this is very frustrating because it's, you know, kind of, I mean, I, I first did a version of this talk in Oxford in um, November last year, and I did use the term fiddling while Rome burns, but I didn't actually really mean that Rome was literally burning at the time. But this week, of course, this being the weather map from Italy from yesterday, um, it's, a, a you know, it, it's a kind of, it's, yeah, it's, there's a significant challenge here in terms of the feeling that experimentation is inadequate in the face of kind of urgent climate change, right? So the time left, as Davidson and colleagues from, from Melbourne wrote a few years ago, for urban testing and trialing may be rapidly coming to an end. Others suggest that perhaps experimentation can be seen as exploited, that it's um, a way in which um, those actors who have the most power can kind of escape from their responsibilities. <laughs> Um, without transferring the benefits of experimentation. So we have a potential situation where we can see an awful lot of experimentation emerging. At the same time, we can feel that it's not enough under the conditions that we're dealing with. And so colleagues in here drawing on some work that Rob and, and others have written, as, as suggesting that there is this then this urgent need to kind of move beyond the kind of assumption that such interventions will naturally kind of diffuse or add up and think about instead what are the kind of conditions under which such kinds of forms of systemic or transformative change can be achieved. Here there's a tendency, I think, to, and this is, you know, where we, we agree and we disagree, Rob and I, about our experimentation and how we think about it, um, that the value of experimentation that is not me but hopefully that's now stopped. Um, but the value of experimentation is about being an interim step towards a different but more stable future. So the idea is how do we, can, how do we work with experimentation to kind of accumulate, uh, accumulate a more ordered and stable social, technical or governance configuration. In a sense here, there's an idea that experimentation is a necessary but not sufficient step towards something else. I think where we disagree is that I'm going to now make the argument that there isn't something else which may be depressing for many of you. Um, and maybe it's a bit depressing to me, but we'll, I'm sure we'll come to discuss that together. So I guess rather than thinking that we have the possibility to move from experimentation to some more stable ground where experimentation will stop and we will in a sense then know what to do and we will in, be in another kind of ordered state from which we then can build, I think we have a number of different sets of evidence that suggest that experimentation is creating this kind of form of permanence, that there's a kind of permanence to experimentation. Uh, one of these papers here is taken from the development of the smart grid in Germany, uh, grid in like, yeah, 2016, so like nearly 10 years ago now, documenting the same phenomena 
Um, I mean, I'm sure the research was done 10 years ago. <laughs> We've had it done, and the paper was published in 2016. Um, and then Andy Carvinen also writing um, from the urban perspective. So there's this kind of sense that several different authors are picking up in different arenas at different scales. Um, the German case is about the national grid, uh, national smart grid system. That there's this kind of permanence to experimentation now. And, how, and so then there is a question about whether and how do we navigate around and with that? And what does that actually mean for what a kind of progressive or transformative politics of climate might look like? And I think this is, this is one of the places where this kind of difference in ways in which experimentation is thought about um, emerges and where like taking a different kind of perspective on what experimentation is and why it's mattering can maybe be useful to help us kind of do that navigation. So from the kind of science technology studies literature on experimentation, we've, we can derive that experimentation wherever it takes place, whether it's in a laboratory or in the city, it always has to have this kind of combination of being flexible enough to allow for something to be reconfigured so that things can be transformed, but also controlled enough to hold together. So if you can't hold the experiment together in some way, if it doesn't hang, if it can't be held together, it's just a series of kind of random things and you can't achieve the transformative potential through that constellation. But if it is too held together, its transformative potential is actually constrained. And that's the point of why experimentation and its design in laboratories and scientific experiments can be take so long to get things right, because you can have too much control or too much indeterminacy in the lab situation when you say trying to find new drugs or testing new products. And this is the same in the urban condition. And I, I think a lot of our focus kind of analytically has been on how can experimentation be controlled sufficiently to govern test beds, demonstration projects, living laboratories that then we can then kind of extract and scale those controlled results beyond the state, the actual site of experimentation. But it's from pragmatist theory and kind of Dewey and inquiry Dewey's kind of concept of inquiry that tells us that experimentations or interventions, social interventions, are often actually there is more on the other side, more on the kind of flexibility side. They are a response to the indeterminate, to things which are just barely holding together, to problematize that situation, to give it some form of control and making it cohere so that they can then, but it's also sustaining this ongoing openness. So which allows for contingency. So this kind of been working with Dewey's ideas about what inquiry means. What does it mean to inquire, to open up, to problematize the city through experimentation that I think we can get a perspective on the ways in which experimentation can be used to generate more of a kind of flexible and transformative space. And there's a bit more here from um, Keller Easterling, whose work I also really enjoy. Thinking about what we want there is about how do you generate configurations that allow progressive politics to create the kind of capacities that power can then be emergent in, in progressive ways. So these are just some of the kind of background ideas that I've been working with to think of experimentation as a form of inquiry. But it comes back then to thinking of how experimentation is situated as a move beyond modernist governance and situating experimentation in that way, I think then helps us to kind of navigate what, is, what it is that we can do with experimentation if it is this kind of permanent condition. So I hope that we can agree that the climate problem has come to be thought of as systemic rather than singular, that it's a part of all of these different things that we mentioned before from coffee to chickens to whatever it might be. That's where it's, harder to kind of come to a consensus is that what a good climate society is, is indeterminate. So the notion of a, what will be a good response to the climate problem is not actually something that is given. It is a matter of inquiry. What will it be like to live in a good climate society? And I'll raise a little bit more on that shortly. I think we've probably 
there's so much evidence now that the authority to govern climate change is multiple and dis dispersed, right? So we're thinking of all the different kinds of actors who need to be brought together in different kinds of configurations. And something we've been talking about over the last few days in the project, looking at water interventions and energy interventions, all the different kinds of agencies that are involved. And it's also clear, I think, in the experimentation work that the knowledge and action division is disrupted. So we don't anymore know and then act. We act in order to know. And that's a rather different situation to be in than one that relies on kind of knowledge being held by particular sets of actors who know, and then from that knowledge can tell us what to do, right? So all those kind of, this is why I'm kind of arguing that it's experimentation is both a kind of response to, but serves to extend the kind of challenge on ecological modernism. It's a response to that challenge, but it served to kind of further disrupt the ecologically modernist paradox. So I'm going to draw on a few illustrations now, you'll be glad to hear <laughs> that from um, some of the work that we did in the Naturevation Project. And this is a case study um, up the road from where I'm based in the UK in Durham. So this is Newcastle, this is suburban Newcastle. Um, and this is about a case of putting in a sustainable drainage system around um, a river called the Usburn, uh, which is a small tributary to the main river in Newcastle, the Tyne. It's partly buried um, through different tunnels through the city. It's also a very flashy river. It's quite short and it takes a, a lot of, you know, it takes a lot of, comes from the green belt slightly into the agricultural areas outside Newcastle. And then it basically comes down a series of massive hills and it can, when it, when there are big storm events, it can really overwhelm the riverbanks pretty quickly. Um, and you see one example of, of such flooding in the top picture here. Um, and so this is put, posed a real challenge for the authorities, the environment agency who regulate, um, and Northumbria Water who are responsible for the water courses, and of course for the city council and for the residents. So when they were looking, to initially when they were looking to do something about this particular area on the river, which is frequently where the river overruns, they wanted to build a new pumping station and storage unit. But then they, because the environment agency then had to use the calculations on climate change to, to work with that, they realized that they didn't have space anywhere along the river course to put in the size of infrastructure that was needed. We just needed too much concrete to, to put in the kind of infrastructure that would absorb that much water. It was, there wasn't enough space. It's quite a heavily populated urban environment um, and there just wasn't going to be enough space. So at the time we were working with the environment, looking at the impact and solution. Um, but so they updated their model and they just, they wouldn't have any, if they, the thing that they could build wouldn't have any significant impact. So they were stopped. What should we do? So then somebody, you know, in a brainstorming exercise, we were looking at alternatives. And one of these ideas was that we should divert the river and create a swale um, and to attenuate the surface water naturally in the natural environment around it. Now they had no modeling of this solution. They had no idea whether it would work or wouldn't work, but they also didn't have anything else that they could do. And they did have, um, this is a golf course next to the river. The golf course were pretty unhappy about the idea of giving up their land to be like a concrete pumping station, but they were reasonably happy to in incorporate suds around the golf course, right? Because it was something that they could kind of then landscape into the golf course. And also they kind of realized that if it was raining that much, probably there wouldn't be a lot of people playing golf. So <laughs> it would be okay to kind of temporarily close some part of the, of the site under extreme conditions. So that was how the kind of um, bargaining worked. And so then that, you know, so they then put the suds in the next storm event, they managed really well. Um, and so then this is kind of changed the learning in all, in all of the organizations that have been involved. And so that they now are much more confident about doing other suds. And again, they don't have the modeling of, because the river catchments are also complex, they, they can't actually model exactly what will be happening in any of these suds, but they kind of broadly know what will be sufficient. And so they this is taken as a kind of example across a lot of cities in the north of England now that this was a kind of learning and then doing and further doing and then learning that's going on. So that's, I think, a, a really nice example of the way in which 
it's through doing that learning is happening rather than that the knowledge was there to act on. And the knowledge, you know, is being translated and transferred in every kind of doing that happens. This is a, a second case study that um, Laura Toza, who is working with me as a postdoc, did in, in, in the Nature Vision Project, it's a place called the Two Rivers Urban Park in Cape Town. And it's situated pretty close to the center of Cape Town. And you can see on the um, probably AI generated <laughs> image that you can see there that there are really great views of Table Mountain from here. Um, the other picture with the fence is of the Cape Town Observatory, one of the oldest buildings in the city, um, which is also located in the park area. It's an area that hasn't been built on, partly because of its um, it's it's between two highways and it's a major floodplain, but also because of how it was designated during the apartheid era. And now there are really significant conflicts over the site in terms of whether it should be left as a green lung in this part of the city or whether it should be used for housing. Um, many of you will know that South Africa experiences significant lack of housing and a lack of employment. At the same time, this is quite poor quality land. A lot of drainage and other things would need to be done to it in order to make it you know, fit for habitation. Or a little bit of it is probably fit for very wealthy housing, as you can see in the image. And much of it is not then going to be fit for purpose. So to put in the defenses that you need, you're not talking really about the provision of mass housing, but you are talking about the provision of quite elite housing. Now, all of the housing interventions and designs, there's been architectural competitions and et cetera, et cetera, are positioned as experiments in low carbon, sustainable and resilient living. And the argument is that South Africa needs to think about how it's going to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. And so we need kind of experiments of this kind to think about what does low carbon living look like? This is the kind of example where there is not really a kind of uncertainty or complexity to this, but it's kind of indeterminate in terms of whether or not intervening to generate low carbon housing in this space will create a good city. Is it morally good? Is it correct? Is it right? Is it beneficial? How will those benefits emerge and be changed? I mean, to some extent, maybe you can say, well, yeah, if it's just high class, middle class housing, then it won't be. But then do you leave the site empty and then there's no housing? Do you create the jobs and the employment? Do you ask for a mixed use development? You get some, you know, housing for different groups. Experimentation then is a political process. It's seeking to both demonstrate and justify the possible while also making visible the frictions, the uncomfortable and unequal and unstable moments in this world. So experimentation is about trying out for science what the good climate change society looks like. What will it mean to live in a different way in a, in a different future? And it's this indeterminacy of working out what's right, what's the right thing to do that can't really be known ahead of acting that I think a lot of experimentation is about. So what is then in the, you know, so I've just tried to illustrate a couple of ways in which experimentation is kind of like playing with those or pushing those kind of boundaries of the limits of ecological modernization by looking at that kind of reversal of the relationship between knowledge and action and that notion that we move beyond uncertainty in, and, the, and a static or agreed idea about progress. Climate change and the Anthropocene city really questions what it is that progress looks like. Um, but what is it then that we can do in this condition of ongoing experimentation where the parameters of how we should act, who should act and for what benefits are open to actually achieve something that we might think of as transformative change, right? And here, I think there's some really interesting work. I seem to be citing all my colleagues from Utrecht. That's a good sign, isn't it? It means that I really have moved to the Netherlands. <laughs> well, at least part of me has. Uh, James Patterson's work on this idea of fuzzy action moments, where he identifies particular moments in policy streams where connected activities create an opening for novelty. And then um, there are others actually who've been also working on this. Um, Janssen and his colleagues from Copenhagen, 
particular junctures in decision-making processes, sites where conventional boundaries and interdependencies amongst material systems are transgressed. And my argument in the work that I've done also with Gareth Edwards and, and Vanessa Castabrotto has made this kind of idea, argument that that's what exactly what experimentation does is that it opens up the existing social fabric and political conditions to difference and it starts to transgress what are established orders economically, politically, or socially. Now, the extent to which those junctures can be held open and create enough change is that's the question I think that we need to kind of address. So experimentation here is this kind of um, matter of inquiry that, that kind of inserts itself into these systems and asks questions about whether these orders are sustainable in these kind of indeterminate conditions is where the kind of power and the grit of experimentation comes from, if you like. And in a paper that Laura led for us from the project with many colleagues from different um, institutions, we pulled together the findings that we had about what it was that meant that in different countries, so this was research that went on in Spain, Hungary, the Netherlands, the UK, Sweden, and Germany, what was it that we could see that was allowing innovation with nature-based solutions to catalyze this kind of change? So not to necessarily to be scaled up or replicated, but to kind of change what it was regarded to be normal to do. So to kind of create the kind of openings to hold open the space for doing things differently. And now, you know, following some colleagues in Sydney um, and Wollongong, Polly McGurk and Robin Dowling, we think about how kind of governance capacity for new ways of doing things is achieved when these different elements are cohered together such that they gain legitimacy to exercise authority. So we were looking at how, into, how around experimentation, a whole set of other things needed to cohere to create what we call a stepping stone that mediates new connections and capacities that effectively holds open the space for the experimentation to gain purchase and to open up these um, systems. And our analysis of what was happening in these different um, countries was that where stepping stones, so say, well, I'll give you a, a more concrete example in a minute, where say um, the insurance sector came to see nature-based solutions as something they wanted to invest in. Um, city planning authorities considered um, something to have been a success. So the demonstration project was kind of heralded and where um, training and capacity building was being done amongst technical staff in a development company. Then those different kind of interventions held enough space open between them for that kind of pathway of catalytic change to kind of gain momentum. So our thesis, at least, is that these stepping stones, these kind of wider configurations of actors that can hold open that space that the experiment start to break open is what then allows for the catalytic change to happen. It also generates new experimentation because it also starts to ask, you know, new questions get asked about what's worked. So experimentation starts to generate more further levels of experimentation. So it's the ground is then changed, but not stable, I guess, so that it's open and reconfiguration is happening. That can be a very uncomfortable position for many actors to be in when that ground is open, um, but it can also continue in a sense. What we are arguing is that you want that ground to continually be moving. You don't want it to reach a stable configuration because that's how the pathway to transformative change happens. So we did this, um, so all very, very tiny little pictures there. But if you go to the Naturevation website, or if you click on, there's a page on mainstreaming, and if you click on any of those little um, postcards, they'll whirl around for you and explain what each one of them means on the other side. So that's cool, isn't it? Um, and there's a case study about each one of the stepping stones and how and why they work, and some kind of conceptualization behind each one of them. And we did, then in the paper, we go into this different cases of the green roofs in the Netherlands, um, and, in, and in Germany and compare how and why it was that green roofs managed to take off in the Netherlands where they didn't in Germany. Whereas as in Germany, it was a, a public mandate was given to adopt green roofs in cities, but it just didn't seem to be having as much 
power as we would have thought because it's a quite strong instrument, quite powerful actors were behind it, but it was in a sense then a singular stepping stone. It didn't have others aligned with it to create that kind of holding open the space and creating that momentum. Whereas in the Netherlands, there was partnerships, more intermediaries, a series of other stepping stones involving subsidies and data and monitoring and training, engaging with the insurance sector and so on. But each of those stepping stones, because they were there together, even if they weren't like officially aligned, there was nobody kind of doing the aligning, but they were coincidental, managed to kind of create a pathway where green risk became more established than where a more powerful policy instrument was used by itself. And so that tells us, I think, something that was quite interesting about how it, what's required to kind of catalyze transformative change, about moving beyond kind of single interventions and thinking about a series of stepping stones. And uh, Lin Chun Se, who also worked on this data and paper with us, has also led a paper looking at the difference between stepping stones for climate change and those for biodiversity. Um, so we've been doing some, and um, we've got some reports also on health and sustainable development goals, which look at which of these stepping stones are most important for realizing outcomes towards different ends. And so, and it turns out that um, while nature-based solutions can generate multiple benefits, the pathways to embed those towards those particular policy ends are different. And so if you embed too many stepping stones which are related to the climate change outcomes, you will leave the biodiversity and health outcomes behind because that's you're, you're reaching a different destination with your stepping stones, if you like. So knowing where you want things to get to is kind of important in terms of this alignment as well. But it's not, I suppose, you know, just to reiterate what we're trying to say is that these stepping stones help to establish and create more experimentation. They don't try to like stabilize the situation. So I'm coming to the end, which probably good thing. <laughs> I haven't been keeping an eye on time, but I'm trusting that you are. Um, so yeah, just, you know, to kind of get, get to a couple of sort of reflective thoughts here then, um, what I'm trying to suggest is that environmental governance isn't the same as Margaret Thatcher, you know, I wonder what Margaret Thatcher's speech to the UN would be like now. Mm. Maybe I should try it. Maybe we should get AI to write, let's get ChatGPT <laughs> to write like Margaret Thatcher's speech to the UN now. Oh, that would be right. Okay, right. I'm gonna set that as like a student project or something. Excellent, right. Um, so, but, but arguing then that this modernist frame is coming to, you know, uh, it's coming aground really. It, it, it's kind of getting stuck in the kind of environmental governance that it needs to do. And we do have a lot of nostalgia for it. You know, it's really good when you can kind of control things. Again, it's really, you know, it's great when we can kind of know everything and then act on what we know. But they are, I, but I just think that that is not, you know, and where the author, you know, when we knew who the grown-ups were, right? When we, <laughs> where the authority to govern was like clear. But those conditions are not what we inhabit now. And there is, you know, increasingly less consensus about the progress that economic and technological solutions on their own can provide and what it is that actually progress looks like. Not least in a situation where we know that economic conditions for future generations will be worse than they are for the current generation. And so I'm arguing that experimentation is both emerging from, but yet serves to further this trend, a reconfiguration and recalibration of environmental governance under these conditions of fragmented authority, the imperative of needing to act without full or certain knowledge, the indeterminacy of what good climate governance looks like, and contestation indeed about what progress or improvement or a good climate change city will entail. And so in a sense, it's no longer possible to kind of chart a pathway to you know, a utopian kind of idea of the good climate change city very much like this cartoon about being able to find utopias by just programming it into a sat nav. And I'm arguing instead that we, we need to be kind of working with the idea of a kind of compass of a, a set of directions to follow um, rather than a prescriptive kind of pathways through which we can get to particular ends. Because those ends are already always multiple because what is good a good climate change city for me is not necessarily a good climate change city for other people. And that we have to know that cities always are multiple contested and, and, and messy, chaotic, and, and, and that there will always be conflicting ideas of the, of the good city, right? 
I mean, there always have been, and so there always will be. So can we get along some shared kind of pathways, but knowing that there is going to be different difference in what we think is of success? And so I've been trying to do a bit of this work in terms of um, those of you who know me will, um, and maybe have seen some of my work will know that I do love a good bit of theory, as you've you know, evidently seen, but I do also um, have a very strong commitment to think that that thinking should have a purpose. It's not just, you know, for my own entertainment. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do, and I've, I've done some work with this with um, for the European Commission in terms of how to approach biodiversity governance, um, in terms of what might principles for transformative change within the biodiversity convention look like. Um, we got those in front of the negotiating team before they went to COP15, so that was quite fun. Um, and we're also trying to draw from our nativation work some of the kind of underlying principles that if some of them are present in the kind of work and experimentation and the stepping stones you're doing. I mean, we found a set of stepping stones that worked in the context that we were looking at. Some of them might work again in different contexts, but underneath them all and underneath others of our findings about what makes for good innovation, what makes for a just experimentation and so on, are a whole set of, uh, of principles that we've pulled together that we share also. Um, yeah, so moving away from a kind of prescriptive mode, these are the lessons, these are the prescriptions, this is what to do. But instead to say, well, these are some underlying principles like making space for nature in a city can generate all sorts of different things, but it won't generate the same things everywhere. And some of it might not work out well, but it will, the tendency will be that it will work out better than not doing so. Partnerships, you know, growing collaborations and so on, uh, focusing on equity. And we most recently did some work for the Dutch government. This is why it's in this really horrible color, because the Dutch Environment Agency insist on this color palette. Um, so this is from a background paper that we wrote for PBL, the Dutch Environment Agency, um, who were, who've written a, a paper on how to support good urban nature in the Netherlands. And they were going to go down a line of, there's some, there's a three, by 30 by 300 rule out there at the moment, which is like, you should be able to see three trees from your window and be um, have like 30 something else is and be 300 meters away from a green space. And that kind of prescription, I mean, you can say, yeah, that's great. And then you just pin it up somewhere and then put it in a drawer because it's impossible for much of the urban space to do that. And also if we had like three trees, like if everybody could see three trees from their window, but all of those trees were exactly the same kind of tree everywhere. That would be like a, also a disaster for biodiversity, right? So the sentiment there is great, obviously, but, but by being kind of prescriptive when there's no need to be, because it's seen to be the better way to transfer knowledge to policy, it actually could do more harm than good. So what we did here is think about, well, okay, well, what does all of our work from Naturevation, but also the wider, work of the research field in this space tell us about how to, what actually makes for good of the nature. And so the first and most important thing is about multiple benefits. If you want, if you want kind of multiplicity of different kinds of urban nature and you want multiple communities to benefit from it, then designing in multiple benefits from the outside is really important. Inclusion and equity are essential characteristics of good urban nature. They're not just kind of add-ons, nice to haves, partly because that allows you to maintain the nature well but it's also because it allows you to actually deliver the benefits to the people who need it the most um, which will give you the most benefits i mean that's not rocket science either but you kind of might have thought so um and maybe the last one was the most challenging was that we said that good urban nature should always address the underlying causes of the climate and biodiversity challenges and that might mean thinking about the secular economy behind urban nature solutions where's all the horticultural industry coming from that's developing all of these um, how do we actually use nature-based solutions to say promote um, passive cooling, uh, mobility in cities and so on and so forth. So you don't just do these things as kind of window dressing, but you have to think about how they relate to the underlying causes as well. Um, so this is kind of a way, you know, it's just an example of how if we're going to be continually experimenting and if experimentation is the mode through which we govern cities, that doesn't mean that we just kind of sit back and say, okay, well, you guys will get on with it, do, you know, away you go, do whatever kinds of experimentation you want. And the hope I've argued is about building the catalytic potential of those experiments by thinking about how those stepping stones can 
continue to foster good experimentation. And it's about thinking what are the underlying principles that can support decision making towards good experimentation. We need to think about what are the capacities, the knowledges, the skills that those governing through experimentation need. And we continue to train them and give them the capacity and skills and forms of knowledge that work for ecologically modernist governance, then we'll just get a lot of bad experimentation out of the end. Because we will get experimentation. But it'll, you know, we have some, we, we have the capacity in the research arena and working collaboratively, of course, with colleagues in, in multiple different organizations to generate good forms of experimentation as well. So as I say, you know, Anthropocene urbanisms mean that it's just vital now that we don't, we in a sense is not for me anymore, at least a question about whether we're going to have experimentation or not. It's going to be a question of who is doing it and how are they doing it? And can we really support the kinds of experimentation we want to see rather than spending the time um, hoping in some way that we can control experimentation towards a kind of unified or singular. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Harriet, for an excellent, thoughtful uh, and thought-provoking um, presentation at times. And um, I'm sure there will be many questions. Can I just check whether people online can hear me? Because I think at the start, that wasn't the case. <laughs> if not, please drop a line in the chat, which I'm looking at at the moment. Um, Do you want to change the screen so that people on, so we can see the screen? Yeah, if that's possible. Um, so I'm happy to open up the floor for um, questions or, or comments from, from anyone, including online. Emma, you have, you've got a question, so please use a mic when you're asking the question so people can hear you online as well. Thank you. Hi, Harriet. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Emma Quilty. I'm an anthropologist. I work with Rob and Darren on the Net Zero Precincts Project. Um, so... I was, I loved the example that you gave from the Suds project. So I grew up in Newcastle, Australia, not Newcastle, UK. Um, and I actually lived for a time next to an overflow river, very similar to that one. So that was a very similar uh, image. So Newcastle, Australia's number one export is coal. Um, and I've always lived in working class suburbs around the Newcastle area that were variously impacted by coal in the form of like childhood asthma, uh, heart issues. Many of my childhood friends suffer from these. This is just part of the reality growing up in that area. Um, I, I loved um, how you were talking through the golf course owners being concerned about the overflow to the area and their attendees, you know, their leisure activities being affected. Um, I was wondering if you could talk um, about the people who were affected by the flooding who lived near that area, you know, were they renting, are they working class families, were they single parents, were they students? Um, yeah, if you could talk a little bit more, more to that. In this particular example, this is a neighborhood which is pretty much owner occupied in Newcastle, but it is relatively kind of lower middle class, we probably describe it as. Um, um, yeah, so one of the things that's happening across the UK, um, and I'm sure it's happening here as well as in, also in parts of the US and, and of course across Europe, is that people are becoming uninsurable. Mm. So the real challenge for these um, residents is that once they have bought their house, then they're responsible, it's private insurance, so they're responsible for insuring it. Um, and then with this, and the state offers only a kind of certain level of protection. The state is supposed to provide people with like flood protection to a certain level, mm -hmm. but when it goes beyond a certain kind of climate range, then the state is not no longer responsible for preventing those houses from flooding. And so you've got a potential where people have bought the house and, you know, 15, 10, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago when the kind of climate models were, you know, more than one, and then the climate models get redrawn, and then the housing which is inside the sacrifice zone or outside the sacrifice zone changes, that changes what their insurance premiums are, and it changes also whether they can mortgage the house. So they may then end up with basically a stranded asset mm -hmm. and no kind of financial flexibility to do anything about that. So for them, a solution was absolutely necessary to this issue. And I think one of the, one of the 
interesting things that has happened since the suds was developed is that that area has now become an area for recreation because it's been publicly opened up. Mm -hmm. So it, some of the land has been taken from the golf course and then some of it was Northumbria water land, but it wasn't accessible because it was just used by the water company, which is, you know, just utility kind of zone again across the river with a fence around it. And so now there are paths there and there's much more wildlife there and people use that land. So it, it, yeah, and then there's a whole another story about social prescribing, which is happening in that area as well, which is where the health service in the UK can prescribe nature as a solution to health issues. We'll never talk about social prescribing again, yeah. so yeah. No. With, yeah social prescription and, and social license I'd love to, yeah. to talk to you more about that later but um yeah thank you thank you so much the insurance angle is really interesting because Novocastrians in Australia can't get insurance oh god yes, uh they can't get insurance uh for flooding um prep, like home insurance like they just won't cover flooding um for houses in Australia whether they're renting or they've bought so yeah it's another really interesting angle Thank you, Emma. And we've got a question from Ruth uh, Lane online. So maybe Ruth, you would like to ask the question yourself, maybe show yourself. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you thanks, go. Harriet. Oh, we can hear you. Just a second, Ruth. Okay. How's this now? We've got very fancy technology, but... We've got a zillion screens. Uh, well. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Try again, Ruth. Okay. Is this, is this clear no, now? Not yet. Try again. I can't hear you, Ruth. Sorry. Can't hear. Um, I can try to put it in. That's the on chat. our end, Ruth. Probably not on your end. Uh, um, let's see. Well, we're trying to figure it out. Maybe I'll drop in a question myself. Ah, oh, you got one too. Joe, you go first. Fine. There you go. I'll give you the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Harriet. This is uh, a really interesting um, talk and interesting for me to kind of zoom out. Um, I'm a sociologist interested in working with Rob on some work on um, household experimentation. So nice to think about the kind of governance angle of that. Um, and I was just wondering, what are the links um, with this kind of stepping stones model and uh, kind of citizens taking things into their own hands. So the kind of links between this this new experimentation and how we can use this to kind of patch things together if we have to give away the big, the large models, and how how can that kind of work with um, you know citizens actions. People took over the golf courses um, in Northcote as well during the uh, <laughs> during the pandemic. So yeah, I was thinking about that and and the way that um, you know householders in Australia have kind of you know put solar on their roofs uh, in, in such huge numbers that well they have to totally re. Yeah. 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 Anyway, you know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, sure. Um, so I think the first and important thing to say is that the stepping stones are not all state-based. Yeah. So some of them are market and some of them are civil society, some of them are educational, some of them are um, framing challenges in relationship to health. So, and those could be a number of different actors who do that, like the insurance companies. So, the, and, and also that these are like empirically derived stepping stones. They're not like a kind of checklist. So these are the stepping stones that we have found that were important in these particular sets of cases that we looked at and that they had a kind of commonality enough for it, you know, they, they kind of had a repeated occurrence that led us to thinking that their presence was of significance in changing things. And when we took like, when we, you know, we did this as a kind of narrative reasoning and that we kind of looked at all of the case studies that we've done um, and and the particular different kind of configurations. And when we took, we said, okay, well, was is this really a stepping stone or is it something that just was happening? And we took it out of the story, did the, could the story still flow? And if, if it couldn't, then it went back in this kind of stepping stone that was needed, right? So that's kind of how we how we did it. And then so and then we were looking for the, you know, the reoccurrence of that, um, those patterns. And so yeah, so I think the team 
Yeah, they did swear at me a few times because there was huge amounts of data that they were going through over a period of six months to with like five or six people working on like a massive amount of data for six months to drive it. So it was it was tough work. Um, but yeah, so I'm but right now I'm what I'm trying to think about is can I remember whether one of them is pretty I like yeah, it's partnerships between community groups and community partnerships either with communities to communities or communities with with local governments were really yeah they were a key feature in lots of the different cases um and so that could be community-led work that cities then came on or it could be the other way around but that collaborative work was like essential to many of the um stepping stone like many of the pathways then had that stepping stone in it um so that was that collaboration was important but also it's yeah, also that kind of contestation was often also an important like stepping stone. It doesn't have to be consensus. It can be the presence of kind of citizens' concerns about something that actually is also then important in that sense. So yeah, so I think your short answer is in at the scale we were looking at, we were looking at collective action of citizens. And that those kinds of, yeah, they that itself forms a stepping stone that is important in some of those pathways. Um, we weren't so much looking at individual interventions themselves by households. That wasn't the kind of scope that we were looking at in terms of our empirical data. But it would be interesting to think about whether household-based experimentation has a similar pattern to it. The nature-based solutions that we were looking at had to be either started by a civil society organization or the market organization or a a state-based organization so we didn't look at individualized thanks joe for that question so we're still juggling a little bit the um technical issues but um i've got the question from root which i'm gonna read um out to you i'll at least give you my interpretation of the question which <laughs> is a really interesting question question about the role of um uh, crisis in relation to experimentation and Ruth gives the example um, of the um, bushfires in Australia and how that has, I guess, enabled moving away a little bit from the ecological modernization kind of approaches to actually opening up for experimentation. And Ruth, if I understand your question correctly, it, that might not be the best way to enable experimentation. So, are there, so can you talk about that relationship between crisis and experimentation, how you see that? Yeah, so, um, so Ruth, we, also did some work in the project to think about what is it that drives experimentation? What are the factors that shape the emergence of experimentation, which is different from the work that I've just presented in terms of how the stepping stones enable and, you know, basically embed and normalize and mainstream experimentation. So in the work we did in terms of what drives the emergence of experimentation, disasters were one of the three key things. That we found so across the um, 18 case study cities so we worked in six countries in Europe and then cities within those we all, and tw so 12 of the cities were in those countries and we also did like another six case study cities outside of Europe including Melbourne actually with Kes McCormick leading that um, and then in China in Canada in South Africa, as you saw with the Cape Town example, and in Mexico. And part of the reason to kind of do some work in those other places was to kind of think about, you know, the kind of how Eurocentric is this work and how other things which are happening elsewhere. But across all of those different places that we were working, we found that it kind of the occurrence of a, a break with normal with normal operation conditions were yeah you know, so in Cape Town the drought, Melbourne the fires, Ottawa a series of really cold winters, but also kind of the um the kind of indigenous politics becoming really important in Canadian cities and kind of questions over land rights um were also really driving like change over what counted as the right kinds of nature to be implementing. Um, in uh, Mexico City, like massive flooding as well, and then very, you know, various different other things happening in European cities. Could be a political crisis or an environmental crisis, a, a crisis in terms of change of, of leadership. They are the kinds of 
breaks in the existing conditions that open up. They make those kind of cracks in the systems where experimentation can get in. But they're not necessarily then the things that you need. I mean, they're not the things that then kind of hold that space open and allow for reconfiguration and resetting so that the experiment can grow and embed and become progressive. Do you see what I mean? So that's the kind of difference between what, we, what we're looking at. So disasters can create the cracks, but of course they crack a lot of other things. They break lots of things. If you can use those cracks to generate experimentation, that can be a good seedbed for them. But it's, I, you know, we didn't find evidence of them as stepping stones that then enable transformative change. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Rick. Thank you, Ruth. It, sounded, it looked like you actually were able to say something. Can you say something, Ruth? Just can checking. I say something now? Can you hear no, me? Sorry, it's still not working. <laughs> you can say stuff. <laughs> you can say stuff. We just so are not able to hear you. Um, thank you for that question. I think that's that's great. Actually, just a reflection on that, in, in also in relation to flooding, some of the um, in back in the Netherlands when I was still living there, we had some floods there as well. And you know the Room for Water program that has been going on for a while, and this early to mid 1990s. That was already ongoing. So this is basically a program which says let's create more room for rivers. So when there are floods, it's actually not a problem. You can actually have yeah, space for floodings. But when a few really proper floods happen, the actual political response was to go to go back to what worked in the past, which was building higher dikes. Yeah. So in that sense, crisis can also actually do the opposite in terms of going back to sort of ecological modernistic approaches. Well, because we because we like control and certainty under times yeah. of crisis. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we got a question from uh, Rosie uh, Welsh um, from uh, the F uh, Faculty of Education, and she's really interested in the, uh, the way in notions of inquiry and experimentation and local, in local initiatives. And she's asking if you have any examples uh, of working with educational sites in relation to experimentation and, and, and particularly the application of principles rather than prescriptions. Yeah. Um, so... In terms of the former, yes, but not in terms of the, well, let's see. Let's see where we get to. So I, th I think one of the most interesting sites here, and, and uh, Ruth and I were discussing it a little bit over, over dinner last night, was that the um, Natural History Museum in, in London has got a really interesting program around urban myth. So that I've been lucky enough to kind of be engaging with them on, on that. So the, the Natural History Museum is in Kensington in London. It's near Hyde Park. And they have one of the kind of oldest gardens maintained since they were built um, with, with the idea of using it as a test ground. So since the kind of 1850s or whenever, um, the Natural History Museum has had a garden that they've kept their scientific records of. Um, and they regularly find new species in that garden, which is like crazy because it's in the middle of London and it's like not much bigger than this room or it's maybe like three times as big as this room but it's not like a huge garden um, so to be able to find like new species of things in there is, is pretty exciting but they are reworking that garden now around becoming an educational site so not a site through which the natural history museum know and then tell but a site through which they are generating citizen science and trying to use it as a site through which people come and share what kind of urban nature futures they want for London and elsewhere. Um, so they're creating it, they're trying to tell the, the history of um, evolution, but also the history of ecological catastrophe through the garden. And they're trying to create sites within the garden for school groups and communities of other kinds to experiment with either artistic interventions or, you know, actual kind of planting kind of stuff, veggie gardens and other things about what they want to see in the future. They're also cooperating with a whole set of um, community groups and schools across London to bring the idea of the kind of ecological garden into those neighborhoods. And so there's a nearby site where they've been doing some work with um, Caribbean population who live in London about what kind of, uh, what kind of urban futures do the Caribbean community in London want to see? And how do we bring kind of ideas about Caribbean nature into the kind of communities where Caribbean people are living in the city and how do we kind of relate that back to the Natural History Museum. So there's a whole set of things around decolonizing the garden, 
relating it to communities, using it as a site to collectively know what kind of futures we want. Because it just, it seems like a really kind of productive place. And then they're also working with the Prince's Trust Foundation, which trains, it has a training program for 16 to 19 year olds um, in all sorts of technical skills, the Prince's Trust, but they are developing a kind of ecological training program about how to do new kinds of ecology for the climate change future through the Prince's Trust as well. So I think, I mean, that's a massive scale. The Natural History Museum is the pinnacle natural history museum for a consortium of 36 gardens, including the one in Newcastle, UK and, and elsewhere. And they use all of those, then all of the gardens are like connected, all the gardens around these are connected. And in fact, David Attenborough came to open the one in Newcastle. So it must be a good thing, right? <laughs> so we've had David Attenborough on site in, in Newcastle. So I think, you know, that strikes me as a kind of really interesting set of educational and cultural institutions that have a presence. They're a focal point in many urban communities and especially in kind of more medium sized towns. You know, that those kind of institutions are really kind of a corner institution, you know, they're things that people have got a lot of civic pride about. And so those are the, you know, they're providing this kind of leadership and thinking through how do we live in an uncertain and indeterminate world and how do we make space for difference? I think that's a really exciting kind of place to look for. So hopefully that's an interesting example for you, Rosie. Thank you very much, Harriet. And a question by Darren. Thanks so much, Harriet. It's Darren Sharpie, Senior Research Fellow at MSDI. I was just reflecting on um, your talk and wondering what comes after ecological modernism. And I think China's answer to that would be maybe ecological civilization, which from my understanding has been written into their constitution and been promoted heavily by President Xi Jinping. But that idea of ecological civilization has quite a different connotation in the in the West. And I guess I'm just wondering if you can reflect on those tensions between how experimentation is, is perceived, un, understood and practiced in the global north versus the global south. And I think at the, at the start of your talk, you talked about how um, um, in, in China, I think you actually referenced China and talked about how there's implementation first and then rights follow from that afterwards sort of thing. So, you know, China's in the position where they can just go ahead and go full steam ahead and do whatever they like pretty much as in terms of the, the, the government's understanding of experimentation. So there's a huge difference there. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm very cautious about identifying a new paradigm, partly because I don't think like, you know, as, as Rob kind of alluded to there, I don't, I don't think that ecological modernism is dead. I mean, I think there's plenty, plenty of ecological modernism around. I just don't think it's working very much. <laughs> and, I th and I think that policy practice and capacity building and ways of working that seek to approach environmental challenges through a kind of modernist lens are not going to be successful. Um, that doesn't mean they're not going to, they're not politically powerful and that they're not going that like technical economic modernism is not gone anywhere in development thinking, in development theory and development thinking either. I mean people who work on development theory and development practice have been kind of challenging the modernist approach to development for you know 30 years or more. And so I think in this, maybe in a kind of, we're a bit late to the party about challenging that kind of development approach. I mean, I remember as an undergraduate student learning about post-development, about the whole kind of idea about development being able to be defined by those people who were, you know, in those places for themselves, about co-producing development thinking with, you know, with communities and practitioners and policy. I mean, it, it's, it's not new to kind of say that modernist paradigms come aground when they seek to control things that are beyond control right um so I, I you know in a sense that's a very kind of simple message underneath what I'm, I'm trying to say about how we think about the idea of environmental policy what's almost more surprising is that it's persisted for so long it's almost more surprising that we've kind of thought about environmental governance as something we can do from a kind of control center and then kind of roll it out everywhere so uh, yeah, but I'm I'm cautious about thinking that we are at the either at the point of a paradigm change or that indeed that what we're changing to is a singularity. I mean, think what I've been trying to say is that 
experimentation is trying to it is exposing the kind of challenge of the singularity and is actually kind of diversifying off into kind of multiplicities and difference and divergence and those things are contested and will be in conflict with one another so we will get multiple kinds of climate change city moments and experiments which are in conflict with one another and i think it is it's that's a challenge because most of us kind of you know, I certainly, you know, I kind of like my jaws tidy. I mean, I, I like to kind of think about how we can have this solution to the transport problem, we'll fit with this solution to the planning problem, we'll fit with this solution to the energy problem, and this solution to the grid problem, and then we'll get food coat. You know, I mean, I like all that, right? That would be nice. But I'm just kind of thinking it's not going to happen. Um, and actually that I might like it, but those voices and groups and communities who've been marginalized and made into minorities in our society, they, you know, what are their good climate change futures look like and how do we make space for them? And what are they different from mine, right? So, so that I think that's the kind of messy space we're in. Um, and in terms of what that looks like, I mean, I think the China case is kind of exceptional for the reasons that you said. And I, and I'm, I am really interested in this idea of ecological um, civilization. I know some colleagues that in, at Sheffield, Linda Westerman and the particular who worked in China before she came to work with Vanessa. They've been doing some thinking about what ecological civilization means for the notion of experimentation and what kinds of ideas of what does it mean to think with and through the environment as part of ecological civilization that might generate new ways of thinking about what urban climate change futures look like elsewhere as well. Particularly, of course, because China is not staying within China. I mean, China's Belt and Road Initiative and all the other kind of infrastructure development that China is doing you know those kind of forms and ideas about urban experimentation are not just confined to China and they are encountering all sorts of different elements of the global south so those ecological civilization ideas are going to be spreading in all sorts of different ways through infrastructure and urban projects elsewhere as well um, but I don't know enough about it to kind of really um, have a, a view on it in terms of how the kinds of experimentation that I've been talking about here how does it fit with what's happening in the global south of course, you know, thinking of the global south as also very diverse kind of sets of places. In kind of major urban, large city kind of scale, global south, we, we've got these kind of experimentations, the kind of projects that are going on in, in Cape Town that I mentioned, this kind of urban renewal, urban regeneration project, the question of whether that should be about social housing, middle class housing. In many ways, the questions are kind of the same. But the answers will be very different and the political implications of them are very much more kind of stark. We've seen those kind of projects all over India, all over Mexico, you know, much of Latin America, those kind of ideas about what should land be used for, who should it be used for, how do we bring in different kinds of energy transitions and waste and those, are, those kind of debates going on in multiple of these kind of urban areas, I think. Um, how, you know, how this works in the kind of informal global south urbanism you're seeing a lot of i've got a phd student at the moment also in track katarina rochelle who works most of her job at un habitat and then she's doing a phd with me as kind of by practice she's working on nature-based solutions in the urban global south in terms of looking at sub-saharan africa and particularly southwest africa and in malawi and mozambique zaire and a few other places um, but she she is interested in the way in which it's the international donor community who are generating new kinds of experimentation in these cities and what it is that they are doing and how in a way it kind of replays modernist kind of development paradigms and to what extent that can is that they're kind of working with nature-based solutions that are actually challenging them to kind of move out of those modernist development paradigms. So that's kind of watch this space answer. I hope that was useful. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Harriet. Thanks, Harriet. Uh, there's still room for some other questions. Um, I don't see any at the moment, but please raise your hands if you like to. This one. Ah, sorry, I missed that. Where is it? In the, it's Just not determined not to let you answer, ask me a question, or that's what it is. Yes, I still have a good question, <laughs> yeah, but um, I think so. But I'm, I can't see Paris' questions. It's in the QA. Ah, there you go. Yeah, I got it. Um, so let me have a quick look. Um, so Paris um, asks the question, thank you for this talk, Harriet. Do you have any reflections uh, on how experimental climate governance deals with more prescriptive 
of specific material claims for social justice, such as First Nations peoples, uh, including land back uh, reparations uh, based on your empirical work. Yeah. Thank you, Paris. Nice to see you. Hope you are. Well. Um, so, yeah, these kind of ideas of prescriptive claims. So, I'm just let me let me think about. It. Can you just tell me the examples that Paris mentioned again? Land bank. Uh, land land bank reparations. Okay. So I'm not sure that I know what land bank reparations are. You see, so that might be. It has a comma in between, so I think there are two okay. examples, but I also okay. don't sure, sure. know what they mean. So we're thinking about here the kind of idea of restorative or re reparative justice of like the kind of making good on exploitation, so kind of yeah, recognition claims to justice. Okay, thanks, Barry. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's always difficult when you can't actually ask the question <laughs> what, what, they, what they actually want me to, to say. Yeah. I think, well, I've got sort of different kinds of ways of going into this question. I think um, I think contestation around land and how it should be used and who gets to decide about that land is becoming an increasingly essential part to experimentation. Partly because, and as I'm sure you know, and particularly scholars in the US have been writing about this kind of idea that climate experimentation is being used to kind of foster a very right-wing and exclusive form of urbanism that is about sustaining good assets for the upper and middle classes and to the exclusion of, uh, of minorities. And so here is a kind of politic, I mean, and I suppose what I'm trying to, yeah, so that this, and, and colleagues in the US have coined this term climate apartheid to signal the ways in which climate experimentation can be used to kind of drive injustice to kind of the extreme. And what that tells us is that the politics of experimentation is, is basically, it's agnostic. It can be progressive and it can be highly exclusive. So there isn't, and I think what that's one of the things that I always get asked, maybe you get asked as well, that when you're talking about experimentation, people think you're always talking about a good thing, right? And so we talked about that a little bit yesterday. Experimentation is neither it's not that it's value free, that's not what I'm saying, but it, it's neither automatically either progressive or good or automatically neoliberal or exclusive. So then what matters is which kinds of interests coalesce around those kind of openings in the city and to what claims are they making. So we can think about those kind of disasters, those openings that Ruth asked about earlier. One of the things that we do see under those kind of conditions of things being broken is a whole set of very mobile interests moving in to make gains on those spaces immediately, right? And that's what can then lead to these kind of exclusive forms of, um, of capitalism. So we see particularly, I think, in the US where protection around land, land markets are very kind of fragile and you've got lots of kind of, so you've got storm, storm damage or whatever in Miami, you have private land interests kind of flooding in, like kind of literally to kind of take over the land and exclude people who have been there before. California, the same, so on. So it matters a lot what land rights are already in legislation, how far those kind of you know conditions get opened up by these kind of climate risks or climate opportunities and who then gets to be mobile around that. So you can have very highly exploitative coalitions formed, but you can also have progressive coalitions formed and the last slide, which I didn't get a chance to talk about, that you might have noticed, uh, Paris, if you, if you might have seen and know both of these examples, but one was the New York High Line and one was about temporary gardens in Barcelona. And they both had some very, you know, both of them about urban space, both of them about reclaiming unused infrastructure but done in very different ways with different kinds of coalitions, both involve the city council, both involve developers, both involve communities, but their outcomes are completely different ones, you know, rather kind of relatively radical vegetable growing in the middle of um, quite high property price Barcelona because it's allowed to be done on a temporary basis. That temporariness is kind of being sustained actually over time. And the other was kind of given over to developers, the high line now kind of seen as quite a a gentrifying kind of part of New York. So I think 
one of the things we've seen in, in Nature Vation is that covenants and other policies around land and what land can be used for are a very important way to kind of ensure that there are some more progressive forms of experimentation emerging rather than kind of free market neoliberal forms of experimentation. But in terms of the other question about the kind of, well, I mean, it's a different kind of answer to the question, but the restorative justice to me is a principle. I mean, it, I don't really think of it as a prescription because what does it mean to, to be restorative of justice in different conditions and contexts is very different. So it's, a, you know, in a country like the UK where we don't have an indigenous peoples, we are instead thinking about how, you know, are we being, and in the Northeast of England where we have very limited migrant, I mean, I think we have less than about four or 5% of the Northeast is immigrant based population. So we're really talking about restoration for the white working class. And we're talking particularly then maybe about um, the long-term unemployed who tend to be men. So, it's not every day that you think we need restorative justice for white men. <laughs> but in the context of, you know, a whole set of industrial job closures, long-term unemployment, unemployment passed down from male generation to male generation in families, uh, you know, huge amounts of kind of health challenges. Teesside, which is about 20 miles away from, from Durham has the shortest life expectancy for men in the country at about 62 years old. What does restorative justice look like there? That's a completely different, yeah, do you see what I mean? That's a completely different set of questions. And so that's why for me, it's a principle that can't be enacted in the same way everywhere. It can't be prescriptive from that point of view. So I hope, I hope that helps. Thank you uh, for that, Paris. And I talk for a long time now. <laughs> yes, you do, you really manage, you don't get to hear my question anymore. That's what you managed to do. But I'll ask it anyway afterwards. Thank you, uh, I'll ask it. I, okay, just very, just very. I've got a question about um, around uh, the subjects of who is being experimented with, yes. uh, in particular in deliberate forms of experimentation, in particular in forms of experimentation that are led by governments or corporate actors and and so on. So and 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 there's there's risks in there for people, like people might lose their homes or their urban infrastructures might not or services might not work as they would like them to be and particularly if you start then also thinking about uh maybe more informal settlements in the global south where um you know we, we've 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 tried talking about things like living lab and experimentation and it's actually often not really welcome that sort of language as well because because i guess to do it for some of those reasons um in in some of my earlier work in in india and thailand um I, I went to some side visits in remote india and quite naively thought, well, you know, he, he, here we've got this great sort of this decentralized energy solutions, et cetera. And we start talking to people, they'll say, well, we don't want this experimental stuff. Just give us the modern, modern infrastructural approaches that all the cities have. So there's, there's sort of that kind of question, there's sort of the subjects in experimentation. And, and what's your what's your perspective on that? Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's a really good question, Rob. But uh, so for sure, that whole kind of idea that people are lab rats, doesn't go down well, right? I mean, like, well, you know, Calvin, I'm not one of your creatures for you to experiment on. I think we, we can see various different kinds of things which are happening. I mean, one, we can see different kinds of forms of experimentation that are happening without anybody's knowledge. I mean, so you can, you know, it, l large amounts of the kind of areas that water companies control in the UK because they're all privately held. They're, they're doing all sorts of different things with nature-based solutions that nobody would have any clue about. Um, and they're, you know, so there's a kind of, they think of it as benign because they think, well, we can't, we can't do anything other than this. So we're either doing this or we're doing nothing. Do we tell, you know, they don't want to tell everybody that we couldn't do anything to protect them. So they want to try and see whether this is going to work thinking, it, you know, it's a do no harm principle. So that if it does no harm, do they have to actually engage with people and tell them what's going on? And as soon as it starts to so not in, not not when it's really visible and you've got a golf course and you've got all people in flooded areas but like upstream work lots of peatland restoration going on upstream of big cities like Sheffield and Leeds to kind of try and get the water to soak into the peatland so that it's not coming into the city I mean 
they, sometimes they kind of quite rightly think that nobody would really be interested or really care very much about what they're doing. And so that kind of idea that they have to engage with everybody all the time about everything is too, they can't do that. So there's a kind of, you know, so there is a kind of like, well, is it okay for people and rivers and other things to be being experimented on without consultation and engagement? Sometimes if there's a kind of no other option and there's a do no harm kind of idea. I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting. And then there's the times where I think where it's done best is where like and I think that they did do it well in Newcastle where they came and they said to the community look we know that you're at risk of flooding we know that this has happened but when we show you you know this is the mock-up plan of what that concrete would look like we don't really think it's going to work and we don't think you're going to like it and this is what we could do instead are you prepared to come along with us on that journey and kind of show people what the alternatives were and tell them you know, at what point there will be a kind of break. If this isn't working, what they're going to do next? And then, you know, and, and kind of take them on that journey with them. And then, but I think in this kind of case where it's like, well, and then we've seen this in South Africa as well, and everybody's like, well, we don't really care very much about solar electricity, it's rubbish, can't we just have the real powerful stuff? That's the thing about a bit back to Paris's kind of question about what are the kind of fundamental rights that, people should have in terms of basic services and if you're if you're denying people basic services and maybe even kind of protection or even you're denying people basic access to healthcare and saying well we just thought you could go for a walk or two is that all right <laughs> you know? um, then that becomes a problem where you're kind of giving some people something that you know you're only doing because you can't afford or you can't deliver the other thing and that's where that's where I think it becomes exploitative. That's where you can see Benjamin Sovacol's kind of argument that experimentation becomes exploitative because it becomes the approach that you, where you can't deliver something else. Thanks. I mean, my question was partly triggered by this argument that exploitation might be a permanent condition that yes. we find ourselves in. And, and you know, when, when it's not a permanent condition, when it's a, when it's a temporal phase, you know, this, you can say we're doing exploitation because we want to learn and try on new things and ultimately we managed to do that and now we have this new safe place again, which may be, may be unrealistic as you as yeah. your arguments are, say I'll be a bit of a utopia. But when you think about permanent exploitation as a condition for us to be in, I think that question becomes even more mm. important. Yeah, because, but I think it then is about, okay, well, if, if we do this and we know from it and then we do something again and then we know from it, and we do something again and we know from it and i think it's it you know i mean obviously we don't do that with things like houses i mean well maybe we do actually so much renovation going on <laughs> but um you know i mean we live in a house and we change it as our lives change um you know so maybe maybe this is the you know maybe this is what we have to kind of think of it as we have to think of it as something which we're where we're always kind of tinkering and and shifting things a bit um but yeah Anyway, to be continued. To be continued. Thank you very much, Harry. Please join me in saying thank you to Harry. That was a great talk. Thank you very much.